In a small place once known as Mineral County, in West Virginia rests a very special rock. Known as Waffle Rock, it is a huge piece of something very ancient, lodged in the ground where it must have been struck many thousands of years earlier. No longer visible to the public due to it being several meters below the water level of a dam built in the area which forced the residents of Mineral County away forever. After a petition by many of the locals, two pieces of Waffle Rock were thankfully preserved for future study. One stayed relatively local to the area, while the other is preserved within the Smithsonian Institute. Dr. Jack B. Epstein of the U.S. Geological Survey said, quote, Four sets of joints are apparent in the Waffle Rock. Just what could have made Waffle Rock clearly remains a mystery, and any hypothesis that links it to possibly having been part of a larger artificial craft quickly shouted down as absurd. The truth is, no one really knows what Waffle Rock is. But such hostility directed towards any extraterrestrial possibilities is something we always find interesting. Waffle Rock appears to have a metallic gritting which runs through some of its form. Interestingly, a case we cover in another video regarding another less mentioned find of a very similar, strange suspected rock formation was found nearby. Were these fragments once pieces of an ancient spacecraft? We find it highly suspicious that the powers that be chose to submerge such a curious thing, subsequently hiding it from the world. They are looked upon with an air of cynicism. The ley line is another intriguing theory that once one begins to dig into, finds the work of passionate, revered, and highly capable individuals, individuals who pursued the subject with hunger one begins to see a rather compelling and convincing side to the field of study, which the deeper one digs into, the more convinced one can become. The Earth Mysteries Movement Much of modern culture is aware of the rebellious nature during the 60s. People rebelled in many ways, and the music became legendary. However, what many people may not be aware of is that there is also a rebellion within academic archaeology. John Mitchell was one particular individual who played a major role in promoting a belief in ley lines. His respect as status risked, as we have discussed many times, for if one even in the most established of positions can find their career disintegrate around them simply for not supporting currently funded paradigm. Yet regardless, John helped to professionalize the discipline. His acceptance, but more importantly, his valiant public exposure of his opinion made the subject a movement, no longer a cynical pseudo-vocation. The transcendence of theory to reality for ley lines meant that it was no longer an amateur-dominated field of research. As one would imagine, the so-called ley lines, upon exploration, began to suggest that not only were they indeed real, but an ancient, advanced, lost, or possibly hidden civilization, not only built along them, but that evidence began to mount that, by doing so, energy fields not yet fully understood in the modern world were somehow being harvested or utilized by these ancient structures. Inevitably, this deepening of controversial conclusions made by many capable archaeologists they inevitably began to be battled against by mainstream institutions. It was in the latter decade that advocates of energy fields and their significance within an extremely ancient culture who somehow knew of these complex grid systems was ultimately the rub, as with the pyramids. It is the advanced nature of ancient ruins, later realized, which sentences said sight to dismissal, conspiracy, and ignorance by funded institutions. Thus, anyone who had researched and subsequently become convinced of ley lines began to be labeled as members of the counterculture, where, in the words of the archaeologist Matthew Johnson, quote, they were attributed with sacred significance or mystical power. Ruggles noted, In this period, ley lines came to be conceived as lines of power, the paths of some form of spiritual force or energy, accessible to our ancient ancestors, but now lost to narrow-minded 20th century scientific thought." End quote. It seems like the many other relics of an antiquity, which displayed extraordinary abilities and knowledge, must be brushed under the rug, regardless of the fact that anyone with even the smallest faculty of logic within their cranium can clearly see that there is a mountain of not only compelling evidence to suggest their existence, 
but that there is an equally large amount of information due to restriction in many forms yet to be understood. Ley lines have been subsequently characterized as a form of pseudoscience. Within the Skeptics' Dictionary, Robert Todd Carroll noted that none of the claims about magnetic forces underpinning putative ley lines have been scientifically verified. Williamson and Bellamy characterized ley lines as, quote, one of the biggest red herrings in the history of popular thought. One criticism of Watkins' theory stated that given the high density of historic and prehistoric sites in Britain and other parts of Europe, finding straight lines that connect sites is trivial and ascribable to coincidence. Johnson stated that, quote, ley lines do not exist. He cited Williamson and Bellamy's work in demonstrating this, noting that their research showed how the density of archaeological sites in the British landscape is so great that a line drawn through virtually anywhere will clip a number of sites. In 2004, John Bruno Hare wrote, quote, Watkins never attributed any supernatural significance to lays. He believed that they were simply pathways that had been used for trade or ceremonial purposes, very ancient in origin, possibly dating back to the Neolithic, certainly pre-Roman. His obsession with lays was a natural outgrowth of his interest in landscape photography and love of the British countryside. He was an intensely rational person with an active intellect, and I think he would be a bit disappointed with some of the fringe aspects of ley lines today." End quote. As one can see, there are many passionate dismissals of the existence of ley lines, and as our regular viewers will know, whenever we see such passionate denials, such encouragements to not even touch upon said research of a subject, a subject one can quickly prove to be possibly real, well, we find such highly compelling. Along with the many other currently unexplained feats of engineering present within the ancient ruins of Baalbek's temples, is undoubtedly the variety of ancient stones that were somehow incorporated into the structures. Although modern academia, and indeed its supporters, who are all seemingly suffering with selective research syndrome, claim that Baalbek is a Roman ruin, we feel, as mentioned, the sheer size of the ancient megaliths that were installed masterfully into its construction are obviously far too large for our Roman ancestors to have transported from distant quarries and who have installed into the structure. We are more than open to this proposition that they were indeed installed and built by Romans, if we can be provided with one single logical explanation as to how this was done. But as of yet, this remains elusive absent any academic explanation as to the site. As mentioned, the astonishing array of ancient stones is also an area that is rarely covered by individuals attempting to convey an air of all-knowing to the masses, as these features are, just like the enormous megaliths present at the site, currently unexplainable. Specifically, it's the pink granite columns. The reason for our focus on these particular stones is the fact that this pink granite is only available at one known ancient quarry, that being the famous quarry of Aswan, located within modern-day Egypt, an astonishing 1,500 kilometers away. Some of these stones, weighing in at more than 10 metric tons, this achievement, we feel, is clear indication of the fact that the builders of these ancient sites were far more capable than that of our more recent Roman ancestors. For example, as previously covered on our channel, Henri Layard brought two Lamassu weighing in at a similar size around 10 tons to London. This task took over 18 months of arduous suffering for hundreds of our modern ancestors, placed a mere century ago to complete. It included several near disasters and included loading them onto wheeled carts, complex systems of modern pulleys and levers operated by dozens of men, the utilization of over 300 men in total, a barge, and a custom-built ramp to haul them up the steps and into the museum. How these same curators, historians, and academics alike can continue to claim that our Roman ancestors completed such tasks 
along with the placement of such enormous stone megaliths, is to us absurd. Was the unfinished obelisk found within Aswan the work of the same civilization? We feel that these pink granite columns could in all possibility be a link that connects these two ancient sites, and in particular, the Great Pyramids. Was Baalbek, with its enormous granite megaliths, built by the same people as the Great Pyramids? Is the giant megalithic exoskeleton of the Great Pyramids, which we have already exposed, built with the same techniques as Baalbek? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling. There are many ancient sites dotted all around the world which indicate a far more advanced knowledge of architectural design than the funded studied civilizations in which they are attributed to. And although, as clear evidence mounts, evidence seemingly ignored, evidence which makes said fields of study look rather foolish, as they seemingly buckle to this new form of intellectual peer pressure such as public free thinking. Thankfully, a rather logical perception, their attempts to attribute advanced knowledge to primitive culture diminishes. As we delve further into this lost history, we reveal more and more compelling links which cross the continents of our planet. There are many, at first perceived as humorously perplexing ancient feats of building, that after further reflection with an artistically motivated eye, reveal an incredible story. These tiny details were added to demonstrate their sheer prowess. Prowess, we suspect, was inspired by an even greater and even more ancient civilization. A nearly impossible proposition to comprehend, yet one we strongly feel is now a high possibility. Set upon a small hill 1.8 kilometers northeast of the Stay Field within Ethiopia, Gazing upon the mountains of Atwa are what modern academia claims are two tombs. Attributed to the 6th century, the location indeed contains the remains of King Caleb and his son King Jebri Meskel. However, like many other unexplained sites around the world, we not only postulate that these ruins were claimed as the work of a less capable, more modern civilization, but there is also compelling evidence to support such claims. They show the same uncanny sophistication using irregularly shaped stones somehow fitted together as if made to measure as found in Egypt, Peru, and many other places around the world. Constructed in a self-locking design which has seemingly allowed them to survive the eons. Who built these incredible structures within Ethiopia? Were they, as the evidence suggests, the same people who were responsible for the pre-Incan ruins found within Peru? We find the evidence to suggest such highly compelling. Within the country of Ethiopia, some seriously old megalithic ruins can be found, many of unknown age. For example, Tia, located in the Sodo region of Ethiopia. An archaeological marvel, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, remarkable for its large stone pillars. But imagine the surprise of initial explorers when they stumbled across an entire church, in the shape of a Templar cross, completely carved out of the ground. Made of a type of volcanic tuff, I'm sure its initial rediscovery would have come with considerable archaeological interest. Who could have carved such a structure, straight out of the rock, or indeed why? It is known as the Church of St. George, and is largely thought to have been constructed around 1200 AD, yet, alas, no one really knows. The Church of St. George is one of 11 monolithic churches in Lalibela, a city in the Amhara region of Ethiopia. Originally named War War, the historical and religious area was named Lalibela after the King Jebemiskel Lalibela, of the Zaga dynasty, who supposedly commissioned its construction. Although like the pharaohs of Egypt, he may have just laid claim to the impressive ancient structures which resided in the region long before himself. He may have also been attributed with the act due to him being regarded as a saint by the Ethiopian Orthodox Tuahito Church. No one can really explain how he could have built it, and many religious followers believe he received instruction from God. With many ancient sites upon earth, if researched heavily enough, reveal evidence that they predate their modern held suspected builders. 
for instance the amazingly designed ancient site of Puma Punku, which contains stones created in weight-bearing shapes, with no mortar ever being used, yet the structures were earthquake-proof. These structures were said even by the Incas to have been there before them, they believed they were constructed by the gods themselves. The only conclusions that can be made from such structures including the Church of St. George is that the builders were highly sophisticated. Enlightening artifacts may vanish, but thankfully, the ancients built structures to last. And a Templar church carved into the stone ground, in the middle of Ethiopia, of unknown origin, is a very curious structure indeed.